Hello, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Taglu Gesese and I'll be in the background answering any of your technical questions today. Before we begin, I'd like to give you a brief overview of your webinar console. To ask a question, go to the Q&A panel at the lower right side of your screen, type your question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu, then click send. If you do not see the Q&A panel, go to the bottom right side of your screen, select the icon with the three dots, and then choose Q&A. We encourage you to submit questions throughout the session. To preserve confidentiality, questions will be read by our team and will not be attributed to you. We will do our best to get to all the questions during the Q&A portion of the briefing. But if we are not able to get an answer for you today, we will follow up via email. If you experience any technical difficulties during your session, please use the Q&A panel to request assistance. Without further ado, I would like to invite our host, Philip. Great, many thanks. My name is Philip. I would like to warmly welcome you to our session today on uh, capturing price and logistics. Me and my colleagues are very much looking forward to share our perspective and knowledge across sort of four topics in, in the world of pricing and logistics, and are very much looking forward to also engage with you on the questions and answers. If I uh, briefly introduce my colleagues, um, first of all, Ryan will take us through why pricing and logistics is critical and needs to be tackled now. And then secondly, Yaron, uh, our colleague from Düsseldorf um, will talk about the supply demand balance in global transport and what that actually means for pricing. I will be then happy to, in a third step, guide us through um, how to actually identify value from pricing. And then finally, um, Ricardo Boyne will talk us through a couple of interesting cases, how companies have transformed in their pricing function. And um, with, with that, I would say let's directly jump into the content. Um, and I would ask Ryan to kick us off with the first session on this one. Um, and very much looking forward to your questions and, and ideas. Right. Yeah, everybody. So like Philip said, we're going to talk through why pricing is critical and really needs to be tackled now. So we'll start off on the next page. Um, with a question. So I think a poll will pop up here, but what is the price for shipping an African elephant from Shanghai to Frankfurt by air freight, should you choose to do so? So everybody, a couple minutes on the poll here. And the, you know, the question's a little bit funny, but I think it's interesting if you ask around, what do we think the price is of a particular move kind of in any aspect of the freight market? You do get a wide variety of guesses um, and even a wide variety of prices depending upon when you ask and who you're asking. All right, looks like we've got results. I see, I think if everybody can see it, it looks like D is the winner in this group. Some C's, some E's. Let's flip to the next page where the answer is indeed C. So close with our, our D guesses, but C, $15,000 for that gigantic move. Um, so quite sizable. Interesting, it's actually something you can think about how to get a quote on. Um, and just reinforces, I think, the, the ambiguity of variety of price that we see in the market. So we go to the next page. Yeah. If you took a step back and thought about just the value of pricing, the chart here is pretty simple, but pricing is the most valuable lever there is if you think about just 1% improvement, right? 1% improvement in price drives more margin to the bottom line than a percent improvement on COGS more volume, and certainly than SG&A or any kind of internal cost improvement. 
And in logistics, it's particularly important because we think about frequently kind of the low margins. That price increase can change your margin percentage by 30 to 60 percent many times. So a dramatic impact on what the actual margins are and the dollars flowing through the business. The other piece I think is exciting here is there's a lot of science that can go into pricing. It is something on which people can typically move relatively quickly, right? So this is something where if you go after it, we can see real changes depending on the contact structure in a matter of months, right? And six months through the rest of the year, harvesting a significant amount of value. Go to the next page, Philip. We'll start to talk about why we think the time is now. I think the, the real change that we've seen in the past few years and just increasingly accelerating is data transparency in the market. And so I think there's two pieces here. It's one, the data that companies actually have at their fingertips so that they better understand their costing and their price. And then two, the actual transparency and visibility into the market and the speed with which we are setting prices to the customer. So you think about just some of the big players are doing this quite publicly, right? Maersk has, in, has integrated different systems. It act now automatically provides instant quotes in many instances, right? Investing more than a billion dollars in the IT infrastructure that enables this. Freightos has met a search where you can actually search now multiple providers using APIs. And so it starts to look now in a world like Kayak or Expedia or Google Flights where you can actually see what different people are offering. And that level of price transparency with the customer is something that didn't exist, you know, two and certainly five years ago. And you think about that accelerating through the next decade, the method of actually setting price and capturing value through it and what was historically a manual process, right, with strong contracts where people would actually say, hey, it's negotiated, we understand our business and now we're kind of locked in, I think will rapidly change. I think on the next day, COVID is, has either accelerated this or just made it more glaring. I think what this really became obvious to people was when we think about the volatility in freight rates through the year and whether it's ocean freight rates like we're showing here, or if we think about the air freight rate, which spiked up and then came back down depending on capacity, right? Everybody looked at this and said, there's a dramatic increase in uncertainty. We see that in the fluctuations we see probably more value than we ever did on service guarantees and actual visibility into where my freight is and how it's being handled. And we know that over the coming decade, the actual volume that is transporting um, in many sectors will change dramatically from what it was in the past. And so let's talk for a few minutes to the next page about the levels of maturity that we see here. And so, where many in the industry is, are is what we call maturity level one. So this is static, it's inside out. It's, I have some clarity, but limited on my cost allocations. Maybe it's assumptions based. It's usually not a roll up of all of my internal data and a good estimate of what it will take to actually move a particular piece of freight. And then I've got dis discounts that I give often intuitively or qualitatively based on my historical knowledge and then the actual negotiation in the market. Maturity level two is I have the insights and, I, and it's starting to be automated, right? So that's, I have real cost allocations, right? Potentially able to actually track that down to a move level. I have price and discount decisioning that's supported by a tool. So when I go to price something, it can show me what's my likelihood of winning and losing or what is the investment that I'm making in this particular move, how profitable will it still be? And then for some of my major customers where I've really thought through it or segments where I have a product that's differentiated, I'm starting to move to value pricing, right? And so instead of thinking about what is my cost, how do I make a healthy margin? It's going back through and saying, what's the value to the customer? And can I actually start to, in this maturity level, usually estimate it based on the value I think I am creating, probably the model behind it that says, why is there value? And I'm carrying that all the way through my selling team, which is communicating that value that's created. And then on the right, maturity level three, which is real best practice here is, I have a forward looking cost catalog with full transparency to my decision makers. So they know what costs are now, what we think they're going to be, right? Where we're making investments, where we're making operational improvements. 
we've got value pricing implemented for all customers. And we're seeing the people who are furthest down the path achieving that. It's often analytically, even on small and medium customers to say, I can see a customer like you, and I can see that how you value this because I can see the dispersion of what people are willing to pay for this. And how do I recognize that maybe you look like somebody who's willing to pay a little bit more or pay a little bit less and they would ship more, right? But how can I start to turn that dial? And then I've got a, I'm fully capturing value through my surcharge structure, value added services. So I've actually broken up the pricing so that I'm charging for these different components and I'm doing it in a way that allows a good partnership with the customer where they're opting in, paying truly for value that they're created. But when there's not value to them, maybe there's a product that is available that's slightly slimmed down, right? So they can still find an attractive space in the market. And then it's increasingly fully automated, right? So quotes are, even on some of the larger contracts, largely created in an automated way, pulling in data once you've loaded, you know, what lanes, what types of freight. Man, reviewed then by a person, but then they're at, they're really instead of spending their energy building a quote, they're spending their energy thinking about like how is what is the right way to adjust this to either capture slightly more value or to really reflect reflect a nuance of the customer that the analytics just can't pick up. And so you move to a world where you've got real pricing that is in line with a forecast, be able to adjust that pricing dynamically over time in many instances. I think what's what holds us back in the logistics sector often is a couple of things. One, it's a rather fragmented sector, right? And so any individual player would say, hey, for me to create this world, I'm kind of the first mover as I go down this path. And so I've got to get other people, particularly the customers, to understand what it is that I'm trying to do. Two is just the low level of digitization, which we see rapidly accelerating, right? We are all in an industry that historically was one of the less digitized industries. And we are seeing it quickly move to a world where a lot of this data is now available that just wasn't years ago. The same thing on the business process side when we think about automation. And then there's really limited structure in the market, like a singular player, like IATA, that would say, here's the type of discipline that we want to instill and the framework within which we'll operate. And so those things all kind of keep, I think, often the logistics sector to the left. Here, but what I think what we see is increasingly people moving up and to the right. And so Jaron will talk to us in a minute here about supply, demand, and the implications that that has as people think about this journey. Yes, thank you, Wayne. So, um, Flip, if we maybe directly jump to the next page. Um, so, over the past month, we have seen logistics pricing changing um, dramatically and uh, of course we cannot really have a discussion on pricing logistics without providing like a very short perspective why we've seen this uh, drastically changing uh, prices in logistics over the past month like in fact uh, prices have, like doubled or even uh, even tripled and uh, so let's take take a step back and uh, have a short perspective um, why this um, happened so um probably like a year ago or so when the pandemic started disruptions across the supply chains happened happened from one day to the next day and we still see industries like catching up with it right and uh, now we even see an increase in demand and um, that led us to the fact that uh, in this very moment they bought like 30 container vessels just queuing and lying on an anchor in front of the port of Los Angeles, uh, Long Beach. That is what on the presentations, all these green dots that you can see. And um, now we want to quickly explore why we see the spike in logistics and um, how we think that this situa situation will likely unfold. Philip, if you quickly move to the next page. So what have been um, given over the past yeah, 60 years or so is that um, we always see more household spending moving to service, right? Instead of like uh, back in the 60s when uh, more than half of household incomes was spent on goods, today we see um, roughly a third just being spent on goods and uh, the remaining part being spent on, on services. And this trend, it was uh, 
stable for like 60 years reversed over the past month and um, here we can see when we double click into 2019 to 2020 we've actually seen that this trend reverses by like three percent and that has actually uplifted global uh, consumption um, spent on goods by like 500, 500 billion us dollars right so people were not able anymore to spend it on uh, on traveling on restaurant visits on uh, hairdressers and therefore they uh, spent it again on uh, goods and this is that has led to uh, increase in demand and um, yeah causes cost um, these effects that we just saw right, right with the container vessels queuing in front of LA when we move to the next page then we see the um, demand side on the other hand and um, here on the graph we see like the, the ocean cargo capacity and um, over the past every year ocean cargo capacity has increased but um, it's also on a downward trend and um, in 2020 we saw an increase in uh, ocean cargo capacity but um, it just been a couple of percent right and when we see just like these uh, 500 billion of uh, additional spend on goods this small increase in ocean cargo capacity could simply not um, meet this uh, increase in demand, right? So we saw um, an imbalance for um, for ocean cargo, and at the same time in air cargo, we saw an even higher imbalance with uh, all the belly capacity being uh, vanished out of the market. Market, and there we have not even seen this small increase in capacity but actually a drop of about 20 percent when looking at the total year 2020 and when we now bring this together on the next page so um, we have seen the um, the uh, spend on goods then we have seen uh, the capacity and now here we have like the freight rates and here we can see that um, ocean freight rates for um, outbound Asia, like Far East or um, also Trans-Pacific, have been skyrocketing over the past month with uh, prices tripling on Far East Europe and uh, doubling on Trans-Pacific, Trans-Atlantic uh, state weather stable. Now, after we've seen this uh, skyrocketing prices, the question remains how this situation likely unfolds. And um, we see three factors that actually uh, drive this uh, situation. First, there's the overall economic growth that um, drives the household income and the spending power. And there we see that we still have a few catch up effects um, that we see at this very moment, but likely um, later this year, the um, GDP catch up effects will slow down a bit. Then, secondly, we see uh, the goods and services split and um, then we also see a trend reversal again that um, once more people become vaccinated and uh, restrictions being lifted people starting to visit restaurants again start traveling again spending their money on uh, hairdressers we believe that uh, we see that more money again is spent on on services and uh, thus the demand for goods decreases and then we have an additional factor a third factor that is um, inventory replenishment so we still see um, companies uh, manufacturing companies replenishing uh, their 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 warehouses after all these uh, yeah crazy months in the past and uh, this creates a little bit of uncertainty um, because we don't really know yet if they will replenish their inventory levels to historical levels, or if they maybe score at an even higher level to make their um, supply chains slightly more resilient and just having more on stock. Taking all of this together, we believe that we will later this year, probably in summer, will see ocean shipping rates and um, also world cargo rates uh, outbound of all major ports starting to uh, normalize while in um, air cargo we believe that it takes a little bit a little bit longer to bring back all the um, all the supply to the market and therefore it will probably be in uh, 2022 where we see um, prices 
start to normalize again. All right, that was our little perspective on the supply and demand uh, balance and how this kicks in to logistic pricing. And I'm handing over to Philip. Great, thank you, Jaron. Um, and I'd like to uh, guide, guide everyone through the um, approach how to identify value. And um, from our perspective, um, I wanna take you through the five-step approach that, that looks at the entire pricing cycle. Um, which we also published in a recent article. Um, and basically this approach has five elements. First one is around optimizing the long-term base load of contract volume versus the more volatile spot cargo that you have in, in your portfolio. And then uh, we talk about setting the appropriate contract prices by developing value-based pricing guidance, which looks into customer and product focused value drivers. And then we talk about the spot pricing um, where we are more looking into a continual optimization of prices based on um, market and product variables that rapidly change. And last but not least, reducing margin leakage is uh, some, sometimes underestimated, but there's a lot of value actually that can be gathered from making sure that um, the full margin is captured and that extra costs for added services or waivers that happen uh, sort of downstream in the process are avoided. And of course, everything needs to be uh, put together and company or logistics company needs to have the right organization, um, tools, capabilities and processes to make sure that they can get the price right. And I, I'd like to sort of um, come back to the metaphor of the elephant that we introduced in the very beginning. Um, to sort of use that as a picture to go through the individual steps. I think the first question I want to capture is um, how many elephants are we actually now going to ship as a contract base load versus how much are we going to ship on an ad hoc basis? And I think what is very important to acknowledge is that for logistics, with all the respective subsectors that, that we all know, um, there is no one size fits it's all measure for pricing, simply because the contract mix is so different. For example, and, and this is sort of our estimates, um, air freight has a very high spot share, which is simply driven by the nature of the cargo. It's typically ad hoc stuff that really needs to go to another place uh, in a day or two. Um, whereas ocean freight forwarding then on the other extreme is much more base load and contract driven. And if we were to put rail cargo or contract logistics on there, they probably would also be in the more contract driven um, side. And what's quite important from our perspective is to um, then apply the appropriate pricing tools to the respective contracts, but also to make sure that you actually have the appropriate portfolio of contracts inside. And because there's always a choice how much base load uh, which is going to be stable, do I put in my portfolio and how much spot do I put in to also benefit from rising spot rates as we currently see in uh, in the situation that Jaron alluded to. So um, looking at that, we recommend that you actually build a portfolio of your contracts, look into the historic development of prices, the historic stability of those prices to actually come to a um, risk efficient frontier that is sort of in a portfolio thinking um, the right one for you as a company given your risk. And I think the, the second point that I want to talk to here about is, of course, that complexity is immense in all those respective subsectors that I talked about. And there are a couple of things that um, we recommend doing um, to mitigate this complexity. I think on the air freight side, it's particularly the nature of the goods, high value, urgent, ad hoc cargo, and it's in bellies to a large, large extent, which also now led to very, very high prices. And, and therefore we believe industry leaders there need robust forecasting models and dynamic pricing. On the trucking side, I think the complexity is more driven by the actual substantial high number of transactions and also the sort of complexity in the network, including backhaul optimization which means there's a lot of advanced analytics 
required to improve consistency and reliability, but also to free up the sales teams from a lot of manual pricing. On the ocean side, I think the theme is reliability, and that's not only reliability in terms of punctuality, but also in terms of um, reliability that I really show up because we see relatively high no-show rates from customers, and, and therefore the pricing strategy particularly needs to encourage um, reliable, compliant behavior of customers and suppliers. And on the freight forwarding side, to conclude, I think here we have simply so many um, suppliers, contacts in the whole network, which means having an appropriate digital interface to manage those complex transactions is extremely helpful. Cool. Then I think to the second point around contract prices, and here I want to briefly talk about sort of how do we actually reflect the value that we create for the customers in the long-term contract price. And there are, of course, a number of technical levers. And to only name a few, this is reflecting higher performance, such as on-time delivery in the price, but it's also making sure that the cost to serve for smaller customers is reflected or that value added offerings are reflected in the right surcharges. And of course, where a company has a differentiated route or offering, this of, of course needs to be also reflected in the contract price. Now to operationalize this, um, we look or recommend a, a model which we call dynamic deal scoring, which means that allows to actually um, increase the consistency and, and, and pricing of, uh, of the, the contracts by leveraging analytics to identify in the first place what are the actual margin drivers. So, for example, um, improved reliability, commodity type, shipment volumes, and then use that to segment specific contracts. And the way we, we look at this here is that in the end, Dynamic deal scoring is quite helpful to bring the pricing guidelines that we set based on those factors centrally into the sales teams and give them a, a, a logic to challenge and look at every single deal that they can potentially do. And in this assumption here, we're saying we have a certain list price, a product, and we want to end up making a contract with a, a certain price. We can check that against the scoring and make sure is that actually a good one based on all the contract and margin drivers that we have in the database. And this one um, in, in the end helps to um, automate and to take away some of the workload and particularly in, improve the quality of the price that is set. On the spot price side, I think um, here the question is how do we reflect the short-term elephant transport market and product variables to maximize margin on the actual available capacity, um, which is of course something that um, is, is perishable. Um, if we think about a, a vessel that is about to leave port or an airplane that, that needs to take off in the, in the next hour or so. And, and to do that, I think the um, approach is to have an uh, spot pricing, a dynamic spot pricing engine, which needs essentially two inputs. One is on the strategic side, what is my actual strategic goal? Do I want to maximize utilization? Do I want to, um, by all means, keep my prices stable um, to sort of define the key parameters for the optimization? But then secondly, also we need a dynamic data input, which talks about um, what is sort of the available capacity, what's the time of the day, what is the weather, what are other factors that dynamically change, which allows to define then through an, an engine the respective price and get that to the customer in the end. And I think um, one great thing, if companies have the transparency and have the, have the potential to actually use web channels to price, there's also an option to do experimental pricing, which is essentially A-B testing sort of giving out different bundles and prices to customers to also test the waters and then optimize their respective parameters. And if that is done um, in an automated way, this may reduce costs 
and on the other hand, increase the quality of, co of, of quotes that go out to customers and make sure that they are tailored to the product, to the situation that we're in at that stage. Now, number four is margin leakage. And how do we ensure that all the additional effort, which is not covered, maybe not covered in the contract upfront, how we do ensure that, that this is actually there? And from our perspective, there are three key items that are required. First one is transparency. Second one is adherence management. And the third one is a appropriate renegotiation pipeline. On the transparency item, from our perspective, it's key to maintain granular cost catalogs to make sure the full cost to serve is there. This is sort of the hygiene factor to really know what kind of um, cost is, is gonna appear for, for delivering the service. But also secondly, having a very clear um, consistent overview of the existing contract, including how much volume revenue, revenue is in there, what are the terms and when are they up for re renegotiation. The second pillar is adherence management. And here it's quite important to ensure customers actually adhere to the terms stipulated in the contracts. There can be free time and terminal volume commitments whatsoever. And secondly, making sure that um, errors and hidden discounts that also might be uh, coming through waivers um, downstream in the process, so to speak, are, are avoided. And finally, the third step, we know negotiation pipeline uh, essentially simply means that um, we're making sure that it's always clear what is up for renegotiation to adjust and, and address proactively rather than reactively um, going into discussion with customers. That takes us to step five. How do we actually shape the organization to get the price right? What are the requirements that we need to have in place to be able to price accordingly. And essentially those are three things. This is tools, organization and mindset and capabilities. On the tool side, from our perspective, it's again, very important to make sure that the approach to pricing and approach to pricing tool support is tailored to respective contract types and one size does not fit all. And here also, the, the biggest challenge is the link to the front line. So we can have the greatest pricing tools and guidelines in the headquarter if the frontline sales teams are not in a position to use that and get their price out to customers, then uh, we are missing a very important link. On the organization part, from our perspective, it's key to dedicate the best talent, have the best people working on pricing, and to also, if you are thinking about changing so if the, the way you do things, make sure that the work is really different. It's not about in, introducing just a tool and thinking through how, how but, but thinking through how this tool in combination of the process and the organization can work. And then finally, there's a lot of um, to be gained from investing in the right capabilities and driving the mindset change across the organization. This is sort of in short a run through through our five steps of the pricing approach. I hope that's insightful and now would like to hand over to my colleague Ricardo, who will talk to a couple of impact cases where companies have managed to transform their pricing. Thank you, Philip. Good afternoon to everyone. So let's move to the next the next page. Um, so we'll I'll walk you through uh, three cases where we actually pulled some of the levers uh, or a mix of the levers um, that Philip was was describing. And the first example is coming from from the parcel industry, where we really focused on the concept of value-based pricing uh, and customer segmentation. Uh, as, as you realize, this is a, a graph of actually the profitability of their accounts and the size of the accounts. You, you can easily uh, cluster them in, in big buckets and inside each of those, there is a huge variation of, um, of their uh, profitability. Each of those micro clusters will require a very different approach. And, and this is what we helped uh, building 
uh, with with these client uh, and with uh, with the teams um, working in in the sales and pricing team in pricing departments. Uh, for for the big clients, what what you do is indeed a client by client approach. Um, many times you simulate with a game theory uh, um, logic what you need to do in order to win the deal. You try to uh, scout through market intelligence who are your competitors there, what they are likely to offer, what their cost could be uh, with an analysis that we, we call uh, should cost um, uh, in order to define how you can be competitive, which elements of the value proposition uh, could, could make your offer a winning offer. Uh, when you move towards sort of the left side of, of this graph is where tools like deal scoring uh, make the difference. Um, and this is about um, being able to understand the different variables that can impact the price uh, and can make the price the, the right one, optimizing profitability uh, in the logic of matching the willingness to pay uh, of, of the customer. And so the more you use, and this is what we built with this client, tools that are able to um, simplify this process of identifying the key variables and embed it in, in the way uh, the pricing team and the sales team are negotiating with, um, with their customers, uh, the more likely you are capturing the potential of, um, of the pricing lever. What has been key in this experience was then um, building capabilities within the sales organization. Uh, a lot has come by developing sales narrative, by uh, training the sales team, coaching them uh, throughout uh, the, um, the process, uh, providing them uh, with tools and also building incentives that are both focused on the results, but also on, on the sales process per se. So making sure that a certain number of visits are held, uh, keeping track of what is discussed in, in the visits so they become more effective um, and so on. These are good principles uh, that are, it can be implemented in a way where sales is, is not just an art, but it's a science and it is, is followed up with, with incentives. The second example that I wanted to, to share with you is coming from um, a container uh, line where we supported them in improving um, margin uh, by a, a set of sort of tactical levers with immediate uh, bottom line impact. Um, and the, the big chunk has been focused on, on those um, lanes and services that were departing very close to full capacity. Uh, with a utilization higher than 90%. And a lot of granular analysis and work has been done to identify uh, why we were getting on board that last 10% in terms of uh, contribution margin. And what can be done in order to swap that last 10% in terms of contribution margin with, with better yielding cargo. Uh, and, and this went, a, about understanding granularly and segmenting granularly the kind of, uh, of demand uh, available uh, and rolling out uh, yield-based booking acceptance rules that significantly improved on a week-by-week -week basis the quality of, of the cargo on board. The other key areas that we looked into um, was the collection, the improving the collection of, uh, of all sort of add-on uh, services that many times were, were given for free, but were actually or priced and then the fees were not collected. Uh, and those were actually valuable services uh, that customers uh, were willing to pay and, and that were, were not actually um, properly 
properly collected by the sales team. And, and the other element was looking quite deeply at rebates, um, in particular on the low yielding cargo uh, and understanding what, what could be done there as well. At the same time, what, what we've done was also uh, looking at tender pricing, contract management, um, the quotation tool, uh, so to lay out a set of longer term levers that required a bit of time to show impact, but still are the foundations of, of the success uh, of this player in enriching the, the results that they reached in contribution margin and in pricing more broadly. The third example that uh, I wanted to briefly touch before we open to questions is, um, is around a global transportation player with about 5 billion in revenues, 8,000 motor vehicles uh, in, in scope with uh, sort of a quite low pricing sophistication uh, and a relatively low EBIT margin. Um, this is a case of uh, great turnaround on the performance, uh, mostly driven by um, commercial levers and, and pricing in, in particular. Uh, simil and somehow similarly to the container uh, line example that we were discussing earlier, here where we, we put um, significant effort was in looking granularly account by account um, and understanding the profitability of those uh, with a, a global view across different business units. Um, and the second, second big lever was all, all around those uh, ancillary services um, that were, were not really priced. And so creating uh, transparency and, and through strict pro performance management, we were, we were able uh, to push significantly the performance ahead. So here are a few examples of how the, the levers that Philip um, were, was describing earlier, then played out in, in actual transformations with, with relevant impact. With this in mind, I'll pass back to Philip and we open the floor to questions. Great, many thanks. And that's exactly the, the plan. We'd love to uh, hear from you uh, what kind of questions, what kind of clarifications you would be interested in. And um, just as a reminder, to answer uh, to ask a question, please go to the Q and A panel at the lower right side of your screen. Put in your question and make sure you select all panelists. Um, that way, we will see the question. We will not attribute the questions to you, um, uh, but uh, our experts here on the panel are very happy to answer those. So I, I think let's start with uh, the first question that I, I see here. It's uh, it's one on the trade flow. So probably Yaron can help us out. It would be, what is the impact of Chinese New Year at the moment, uh, or post Chinese New Year at the moment on port congestion and reliability? What's your perspective? Yeah, you're on mute, Yaron. Oh, sorry. Yeah, but uh, it's an, it's a uh, very interesting question to to open the stage. Um, as I see it a bit, is that um, the Chinese New Year and uh, somewhat the reduced economic activity in uh, in China is taking a little bit of uh, of pressure from the system, right? Like um, over the past few months, this uh, the entire like uh, ocean ocean freight was like. Uh, so much under pressure with uh, the spikes in demand. And um, I think now we see a little bit of pressure being removed from the system for like um, probably like two reasons. The first one is probably that um, more equipment, like um, all the boxes can actually be relocated. And while we breathe a little bit in the systems, we can get all the uh, containers being educated from uh, North America and Europe and get them uh, at least to some extent uh, 
back to Asia. And the other point is probably that um, this year during Chinese New Year, we have seen less uh, blank sailings uh, than in the past years, I suppose. And um, that will also help to solve a little bit of the um, backlog that um, we have seen in uh, in uh, in China, right? That uh, there is there are containers that have just been rolled over and rolled over and being rolled over again, and now we can maybe solve some of these backlogs and uh, evacuate these containers. So I guess the impact will positively um, somewhat positive on um, on freight rates and um, will take a little bit of pressure from the system. However, it will probably not solve uh, this issue of container vessels queuing in front of the Port of Los Angeles uh, right away. Is that answer the question? Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Jaron. Um, then I'd say the, the next question that I see is, uh, what roles do pricing platforms play in the logistics market? And Ricardo, do you want to take this one? Uh, yes. So th this is, uh, let's say, phenomenon on the rise. Um, as as uh, Ryan was was saying earlier, uh, the, the use of of digital in this industry has 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 been coming more recently, um, and overall also the pricing approach. Uh, and the sales approach in the logistics industry, broadly speaking, um, has been quite conservative. Uh, for sure, the the role of these platforms is is increasingly significantly. But let's keep in mind that a significant share of of this market, at the same time, is contracted out well in advance. Uh, and so there is a share of the market that currently still goes through more traditional uh, ways of distribution, and that is a, a good chunk of it. Great, thank you. Um, I have one more question. Um, that's probably one for 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 Ryan. Um, sometimes one can understand maximizing pricing strategies as increasing price logistics costs to our customers. How do we prevent this path and be able to explain it in a B2B sector? Yeah, I think that is a great question. And I think there's an internal and a, an external version. One, I think that we think about it as increasing price. Really, we should be thinking about it as kind of maximizing our margin dollars in the end. And so, what I see a lot of people doing with the increased data and a lot of the platforming that Rick just talked about is getting to the place where we're actually just sharper on where we should be on price. So we are winning more at a healthy margin and balancing out our capacity more effectively. Outwardly, I see kind of two pieces of two ways to explain it. One is, is around that, that sharpness and, hey, we do a very good job, we think, reflecting the market and what the price is. And then two is actually saying like, no, we price to value and we want our customers who value this to be able to pay for and get the level of value that they need. And so that's harder in a pure commodity by really transactional move. But as that flexes away from something like that to there's more value added in the move, really being to say like, no, we've actually preserved this for people who are willing to compensate for it. And so you kind of pay for a solution that you are getting. And then I think it comes less away from, am I just increasing price and more, we have value to people who actually value it, get to use this capacity in this way. And that's where kind of, you can tear it in many ways off that. Great, we have one more question, um, probably for Ricardo. Um, could you elaborate a bit more on what the key success factors are when moving towards the upper right corner of the price maturity chart? Uh, thank you for, for the question. Um, I, I'll frame the answer in four elements. Um, so number one is go in small steps. Um, we don't believe that the solution is necessarily like a big transformation of four years, um, super complex IT development, waterfall based. Because um, then four years from 
from now, maybe you'll discover that the system works or it doesn't, uh, and maybe it won't be current anymore. Uh, so the, the logic is is try uh, to break the elephant in pieces and uh, and go step by step, uh, building on in a more agile uh, way of working. The second point is don't focus just on systems. Pricing is about people, uh, so it's processes, it's capabilities, as as we said uh, at some point. Um, and the human element many times makes a difference. So the systems and the tools should be decision uh, support tools, uh, sometimes prescriptive. So they, they make some, some of these decisions for us, but what will make the difference is really your, uh, your team uh, and how they are using those tools. Um, the third element is break the silos in the organization. Um, and many times in, for example, container um, liners, we see trade management working very far from sales, uh, following very different approach, not uh, having processes to speak to each other and coordinate well. Um, and so this is what will, will make the, the tools that you're building uh, work. Uh, and they make them relevant in the very specific client situations where they are applied. And, and the last point is do invest in building a, a data lake. There are plenty of uh, internal, external data, structured, unstructured, that today maybe are unclear how to use. Building those links and experimenting with, with that logic I was describing in point one will generate um, ideas that you can't even think of. Great, then uh, I think one more question, probably Ryan, you can help us here. Uh, what can we learn from other B2B and B2C industries in terms of pricing and then take to logistics? Good question. Um, I think a, a couple things stand out to me. One is that we look at um, I think most of those industries, we still see a, kind of a widespread in who is best in class versus not. And so it tells me that like everybody's on some version of this journey and there is real opportunity to differentiate. A couple of things I think that in the logistics space we could port over and think about is I think about all of the manufacturers who are quite good now at what is the raw materials index? How do I think my cost structure is going to move? How do I pass that through to the customer and manage that in many cases quite dynamically? Um, I think there's lessons to be learned there and just how they, even they structure their contracts to allow that to happen quite naturally. The other piece is um, if I think about some of the industrial players who would say like, they provide what you could call a plain vanilla product, but in many instances they move to kind of what are the services or differentiation about that product that makes it different than my base level product and tiering that, which goes back to that value pricing piece um, that we had talked to initially, where I think everybody could push their thinking in the logistics space. And then the last piece is just, I mean, on the data side, if we look all the way out to kind of some of the further of field industries like in the tech space and just what they are able to do with really understanding the customer who the customer is what their buying cycles patterns look like when we should be following up and then the implications of that on price and kind of the way that they manage their price investments to keep people excited when they give them an offer how they bring them back in i think there's quite a bit there that will be very valid in the logistics space and maybe Ryan, one element to uh, to add out of the the, the travel, uh, the passenger travel experiences in pricing, is fo focusing on on building products through bundling and unbundling of specific pieces of a service. Because yeah. yes, what the transportation service is doing is bringing an object or a person from a point A to point B, 
but, but there are a bunch of attributes that in some cases for some customers have value in, in a very specific context of booking and for some others um, don't have a value. And for goods as it is for people, not necessarily the same client as the same needs every single time uh, she's booking uh, a transportation service. And I'll bring the very practical example uh, from the far uh, airline the industry that we all know is very different from logistics, but all of us, when we work for travel, are a certain kind of customer with a set of needs. The very same person is totally different in terms of needs when we are booking a flight with our family. So being able to recognize uh, the differences in the context of the booking and building products, working on the attributes of inclusion, exclusion, capability of tracking the product, guaranteeing a certain day, time, uh, hour of delivery, uh, as, as an example, or a certain routing, uh, this is something that could help you um, and help this industry in, in making the service better. And so also being able to charge for a better service. Okay, great. Then thanks very much, Ryan and, and Ricardo and Yaron for, for the comprehensive answers. I haven't seen any further questions. So um, in, in this case, I would like to conclude by saying thank you very much to the panelists. Thank you very much for joining us today to discuss pricing and logistics. And of course, very happy to let us be in touch. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye.